Go in the description, subscribe to the New Testament Review Podcast with Ian Mills and Laura Robinson. Ian Mills, New Testament Podcast Review, Q Source. What the heck is going on with the Q Source? Sure. Uh, the Q Source is a hypothesis um, to explain what we call the double tradition. Double tradition are places where Matthew and Luke have high verbatim agreement. They're telling the same story in all the same words, um, up to 40 words at a time, verbatim agreement between Matthew and Luke. Um, strings of word for word agreement in a language that Jesus didn't speak, in a language that doesn't require word order. So they're not only using the same words, but they're telling, they're, they're putting those same words in the exact same order. Um, and so you need some sort of literary explanation for how did Matthew and Luke do this. Um, and there are two main schools of thought. There are the two source theory, which is confusingly also sometimes called the four source theory, but they have the same explanation for this double tradition, this Matthew and Luke verbatim agreement. And there is the fairer theory or the fairer golder theory or the fairer, fairer golder goodacre hypothesis, um, which are all the same thing, which says that Luke is reading Matthew. Um, there aren't many other explanations that have current advocates. There are a few, you know, the scattering of scholars who think um, Matthew might have read Luke, but I think there are very good reasons to dismiss that, and not many scholars have been persuaded of that position. Um, and it's hard to imagine other explanations. There are a few scholars who have said Luke used Matthew and also Q existed, um, but I think that is just a sort of fundamental confusion about how we do history and why, what would justify positing a hypothetical source. Um, and what we would even mean by Q. Um, so the fair theory that Luke read Matthew um, doesn't deny that there were hypothetical sources. There were, that there were sources underlying the Gospels. Um, it is totally possible that um, Matthew got the double tradition from a literary source. Um, but that isn't the same thing as the Q theory, where you can use these verbatim agreements between Matthew and Luke to reconstruct a, the contours of a discrete source, a discrete text. So to dumb that down for people like me, yes. <laughs> you're saying that there are sources possibly used and likely used. However, it's not that this is a gospel, like a Q source. Exactly. It's not like another version of Mark with just saying, so to speak. It could have been like the same way Mark might be using Hebrew scripture. They're using something maybe else, but it's not a gospel, so to speak. Right. Well, the Q source is so there's, there's 220 some it's I don't know, 220 some verses uh, between Matthew and Luke where the, we have high verbatim agreement um, and it's mostly sayings material um, the narrative introductions for these sayings um, the sort of most of the miracles and stuff isn't double tradition um, it's mostly sayings material uh, with a sort of narrative introduction because we have to explain the overlaps of the teaching of John the Baptist and the temptation narrative and a few other things um, and so. Uh, Q theorists, two source theorists, believe that we have this sort of pattern of relationships of the Gospels that we can use to reconstruct a particular saying source, and then we can go back and look and reconstruct the theology of that hypothetical document. Um, so fair theorists are totally open to the possibility, the people who believe Luke read Matthew, that there were other Gospels written. Luke refers to, you know, multiple Gospels that he's using as a source in his prologue in Luke chapter one. Um, we think those are probably Mark and Matthew, um, but might have there been other ones? Absolutely. We have all sorts of fragments from Oxyrhynchus and elsewhere of other Gospels that don't survive. Um, I'm, I spend a lot of my time working on those. We have uh, attestations to other Gospels, people discussing, quoting, citing, even writing commentaries on Gospels that don't survive. Um, that's the topic of my dissertation. Um, so sure, there were, there were definitely other Gospels, and it's totally possible that Luke and Matthew have some of those as their source. What the fair theorists are saying is that there is no good reason to believe Luke was ignorant of Matthew, and therefore no good reason to reconstruct a hypothetical Q. In fact, it's a little bit stronger than that. We would say there are very good reasons to believe that Luke was reading Matthew. Interesting. And you personally are in that school of thought. Right. Yep. You work with Dr. Goodacre. He's my advisor. This is this is awesome, by the way. Uh, he did a great show on Myth Vision Podcast on this topic. And 
you also, and we're going to be getting into, I think, fragmentary gospels, things that you say like you really are interested in that blow this away. Does any of that play a role in this? Or? Some people have tried to argue that. Um, some people have argued, Helmut Kester has argued that we have um, second century attestation uh, or second century support for the reconstructed Q, that there are other gospels um, and gospel traditions that sort of reflect what scholars would reconstruct Q to be using Matthew and Luke. Uh, I don't think those arguments have been persuasive, and I don't think most people have found that to be very compelling. Um, partially because people in the second century are quoting gospels so loosely, and when you write a new text, you're going to be adapting your sources, um, and usually a more parsimonious explanation is that folks are, you know, folks like Justin Martyr are quoting Luke or Matthew um, just sort of fluidly, just sort of, they're not particularly interested in the precise wording of these texts, they're interested in the point, and so when they quote them, they end up sort of meshing, meshing them together. Um, and that usually is a sort of, that usually is a more plausible, because we think, we have good reason to believe these texts existed before Justin as discrete, identifiable texts. Um, it's usually more plausible to see Justin as just citing that. Interesting. This whole thing, I'm still wrapping my head around this, and I've got a lot of friends, scholars, that are Q source uh, proponents. What would you say, and this, you probably don't get this question often, what would you say are the, the weak points of the Q, or the Ferrer hy hypothesis, the Good Acre hypothesis? Sure, the weak points in the Ferrer theory. Um, the, the, the strongest argument, so far as I can tell, uh, for the two-source theory um, is unpicking. Unpicking is a sort of way of formalizing alternating primitivity. So let me back up just one second here. Okay. Um, if Luke read Matthew, then we should expect Luke to always seem secondary to Matthew. Um, if we have the same form of both sayings, we could expect Luke to look like a slightly later version of Matthew. We should expect Matthew to look more primitive, is the language that's used. Um, and the problem with this, of course, is when we're talking about texts written at the end of the first century, beginning of the second century, how on earth are we supposed to figure out what is or isn't more primitive, right? Um, most people agree that Luke, a lot of the times, looks less primitive. This is uncontroversial. Both sides agree about this. Luke often cleans up the language, um, has a sort of more vo variegated vocabulary, um, will sometimes, well, often cleans things up to reflect a sort of delayed esch eschatology, you know, or sort of realization that the world isn't imminently ending. Um, and this is uncontroversial between two-source theorists and fair theorists. But uh, two-source theorists will want to add to this and say there is also evidence Ex uh, examples where Matthew looks later than Luke. Um, and the classic examples of this are blessed are the poor versus blessed are the poor in spirit. Um, Luke has blessed are the poor uh, and Matthew has blessed are the poor in spirit. Um, also the finger of God by the, by the power of God we see um, between the two gospels. And I don't think either of these arguments work. Luke is very interested in the, mar in the plight of the poor and the marginalized. Um, it is totally plausible in light of the other ways he changes Mark and the ways of the things he emphasizes in Acts that he would take blessed in the poor spirit in Matthew and make that blessed in the poor. Okay, but the thing I was going to talk about was this unpicking argument. And we did a podcast on this, um, uh, uh, about Downing's argument for unpicking. Um, and the argument is that it is implausible that, a, that Matthew... It is implausible that Luke would come along and um, read and find in Matthew, take just the bits that are Matthean additions to Mark and recontextualize them. Uh, that is, you have to imagine Matthew, Luke reading through Matthew and isolating those parts of stories that Matthew, where Matthew is copying out of Mark, isolating those parts of stories, decontextualizing them and incorporating them in new places in his gospel. Because to do that, you would not only need to be writing your own gospel, but as you're doing that, you would need to be comparing Matthew to Mark, crossing out the bits in Matthew that are in Mark, and then taking those parts of the story and recontextualizing them. And this, I think, is the best argument I've ever seen for the two-source theory. Wow. That gets pretty deep. Yes. And I think it's been compellingly shown by Ken Olson and others that unpicking 
doesn't happen. That when Luke recontextualizes um, these Mathene editions, uh, Francis Watson has shown he often takes over the stuff, the mark in context, or at least hints of the mark in context, which is exactly what you would expect him to do if he's finding these, this material, not in Q, but in Matthew, which has added it into Mark. And um, several of the other most famous, famous cases uh, Ken Elson has shown are not actually examples of unpicking. And I think uh, the basis of this whole thing is Mark and priority, which is a given, right? Are there any like serious scholars in the world that are in academic circles that actually believe in not the priority of Mark? Or? I'm sure there are serious theologians. I'm sure there are um, people who spend time being serious in other kinds of uh, the acad parts of the academy or doing writing other kinds of history that think Mathene priority is a serious possibility or advocate Mathene priority. What there aren't are people who publish on the synoptic problem, mainstream scholars of the Gospels um, who advocate anything other than market priority. Um, there was a movement in the 1960s that worked, that lasted up until the 1980s um, that advanced what's called the Griesbach hypothesis. Um, William Farmer and his disciples, who argued that Matthew was the first gospel, that argued in favor of Matthew, um, of the Mark and Conflator hypothesis, that Mark was last. Um, but these have mostly died out or disappeared. Um, scholarship for the last at least 40 years has been dominated by people who believe in Mark and priority. Um, despite differences on almost everything else, the arguments in favor of Mark and priority are so compelling um, that it's really hard to find anyone who disagrees with Mark and priority, who is, does you know, peer-reviewed scholarship on the Synoptic Gospels. Let me ask you one more because this is actually not, this wouldn't be an academic question that you guys really deal with in the, in the terms of the textual evidence. But if we said, all right, we don't even have the Gospels in front of us, and we aren't even looking at them, and we were to look at church history, sure. and we looked at Eusebius' quotations of Papias, and we were trying to say, okay, or we're trying to get the earliest church father's recognition of these texts, which one does the church say came first? Was there a Hebrew version of Matthew that came first, according to the church? Or was Mark, and they just didn't have the chronology correct? This is really hard to tell. So, okay... What is absolutely true is by the time you get um, to, I mean, by the time you get to Eusebius for sure, um, and Augustine, people like that, they believe in Mathene priority. Um, so they believe Matthew wrote his gospel in Hebrew, which is almost certainly not true, and there's very good reasons to believe it's not true. Um, and Matthew is a disciple of Jesus uh, and wrote his gospel in Hebrew. He came first, and subsequently, um, Mark, Luke, and John were written. It is not clear that Papias believes this, and Papias is the source of these traditions. And this is what's the complicating factor, is um, Clement, uh, Eusebius, they are just getting this information from Papias and then sort of working it out um, from there. And Papias presents Mark first. He doesn't say Mark was written first, but it is curious that he says Mark was a hearer of Peter and wrote down the teachings out of order, and Matthew put them in order, or he put them in the correct order, but wrote in Hebrew and was translated into Greek. So there's a couple things in play there. First of all, this may be a memory of Mark and Priority, although I need to emphasize that Papias doesn't say so explicitly. Um, but uh, more importantly, um, it is where the tradition of Hebrew Matthew comes from, is this Papias thing. But Papias himself, doesn't have Hebrew Matthew, right? He has all these different Greek copies, and because he believes Matthew wrote it, well, it must have been written in Hebrew. Um, because we can explain how Mark ends up in Greek, because it's not written by Peter. But if it's written by a disciple of Jesus, it must have been written in Hebrew. And so, um, and these are his, apparently, Papias' justifications for writing his own work, the, the um, exegesis of the sayings of the Lord, or the Dominical Oracles, if you want to take uh, Stephen Carlson's reading of this. Um, so, Papias himself doesn't seem to have any direct knowledge of Hebrew Matthew, and yet he is where that whole tradition that becomes formative for the whole church's account of uh, the origin of the Gospels is rooted in Papias. Mm. And there are other good reasons to be skeptical of Papias having any direct knowledge of what the disciples were up to. Um, Papias conflates the two Philips. There's a Philip uh, disciple of Jesus, and there's a Philip who 
a Greek in Hierapolis with daughters in the letter of Acts, or in the, in the book of Acts, um, and he combines these Philips. Um, so between that and Hebrew Matthew, um, there doesn't seem to be good reason to think that Papias is in fact in touch with where these texts originated. I think it's interesting too for our, the inerrantness, the people who believe that there's no errors here, that Papias looks at uh, the chronology of Marcus as well. They, he jotted down the truth, but he got it all in the wrong order. And then Matthew says, well, it was correctly in the right order, except the translators goofed up the details when they translated. Inerrantists have different ways of explaining this or talking about this, um, but it is uncontroversial. It is undeniable that the synoptics tell the same stories in different orders. Um, and this sometimes bleeds through into their narrative. So Luke moves the rejection of Nazareth um, earlier in his story. He moves it to the beginning of Jesus' ministry, um, uh, to Luke 4. Um, and it's in his source that comes after Jesus has been in Capernaum. And then Jesus goes to, the, to, to Nazareth and they say, do for us the, the wonders you did in Capernaum. But in Luke, he hasn't been to Capernaum yet. <laughs> and so Luke keeps this note um, that only makes sense in his literary source. Um, and of course, uh, fatigue in the synoptics, Mark Goodacre's article, gives other interesting cases of this. The feeding at Bethsaida happens in the wilderness in Mark, happens in the desert. Luke moves that into the fishing village of Bethsaida, but preserves the comment, go out into the neighboring villages and countryside to get food for we are here in a deserted place. But in Luke, they're not in a deserted place. They're in a major fishing village. So there's a sort of preservation of source usage of um, the different orders it was in different gospels. And then, of course, John is a whole other creature. Oh, yeah. I mean, John moving the temple to the beginning of the ministry. Um, it's There's tons of examples of this um, in John. So, Well, I mean, John doesn't have a lot of overlap. John has mostly different stories. So there's tons of examples of this in the synoptics. And then John is a radically different creature in that we get whole different stories told. Final question pertaining to Q, because we rabbit trail just a little, but for fun. I enjoy it. That's why I knew you I knew you'd enjoy that as well. <laughs> um, what do you see scholarship in the next 20, 30, 40 years on this Q source hypothesis? What, what do you see happening? Do you think that hmm. there's gonna be a takeover at some point on, on Good Acres, Bear, etc.? Mark Goodacre has done a remarkable job of making this view much more mainstream. If you went back to when he began began his career, um, the fair theory was idiosyncratic. It was associated with Michael Goulder, who is a brilliant scholar, was a brilliant scholar, but had all sorts of absolutely out there ideas. He once published a piece arguing that Paul was the beloved disciple in the Gospel of John. Go figure. Um, yeah, I mean, nobody takes it seriously. It's a wonderful piece to look at how someone brilliant can come up with absolutely baffling ideas. Um, so unfortunately for the Ferrer theory, um, which was named after Austin Ferrer, who was a famous theologian at Oxford, uh, did, the, did C.S. Lewis's funeral, um, was a friend of C.S. Lewis. Uh, unfortunately for the Ferrer theory, it was associated with Michael Goulder and sort of sidelined as one of, the, one of those eccentric ideas. Um, and Mark Goodacre in his Case Against Q book, which I've got up there somewhere, um, and his other important articles, Editorial Fatigue, Too Good to be Q, um, has really shifted the, the playing field. Um, it is now probably something close to 50-50 or 40-60. Um, the field has drastically shifted towards the fair theory. Um, and I think, I think it will continue to shift, but of course, I'm partisan. Um, I came to work with Mark Goodacre because I was totally persuaded of the fair theory. Um, and my undergraduate mentor, uh, Melissa Salu, is, um, is a two-source advocate. And I, I learned that from her and adopted the position first and then ended up shifting on that um, in the course of my research. So I think it's going to keep moving that way. But, you know, uh, we are making predictions. We'll have to see. Um, I don't think that alternative theories are going to be compelling. Um, I have done a lot of work on the whole Marcion question. Um, it's a huge part of my dissertation. I've done a lot of work on um, the relevance of Papias to this question and other non-canonical gospels. Um, I've done <laughs> what I feel to be sufficient uh, inquiry into suggestions about the earliness of John or Luke being before Matthew. Um, and I just don't think those viewpoints are going to get much traction in the field. And for good reason. <laughs>